So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Kordemeyer, and this is my colleague, Pam Pierce. We'll introduce ourselves more fully in a moment. Uh, we want to thank you so much for coming to uh, our panel today, Outside the Frame, Reflective Writing and Critical Librarianship in Medical Education. Uh, we came to this topic because we have a, a real interest um, in medical humanities, in the possibilities for uh, reflective and creative practice in medical education. Um, and we're really, really excited to share what we've learned so far with y'all in this uh, quick workshop today. Uh, so my name is Sarah Kordemeyer. I am the library director, formerly the instruction and outreach librarian at the University of Arizona Poetry Center. Um, and I'll be speaking today about a collaboration undertaken here on the UA campus uh, with two of my librarian colleagues in health sciences, uh, Yamila Elkayat and Scott Buchanan. Uh, they're unfortunately not able to be with us at this conference. Uh, Scott has actually moved on to a different institution, uh, but I will try not to, uh, I will try to represent what they, what they, uh, what they gave, gave me and what I learned from them very accurately indeed. Uh, so that's me. Uh, Pam, how about you? I am the Digital Scholarship and Repository Librarian at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. And I've been working with our narrative medicine curriculum, uh, both within the School of Medicine and with the Northwest Narrative Medicine Collaborative. And it's been exciting to see the role that humanities can play at a health science university. And I'm glad to be presenting with Sarah uh, because I'm also from Tucson and I've done work at the Poetry Center at various times. So it's great to be seeing all these connections come together. Thank you, Pam. Um, so I will go first and I will just jump into a very fast kind of whirlwind tour of the things that uh, we tried out with our colleagues in health sciences uh, last year, or I guess two years now ago, by this time in 2018. Uh, we undertook a collaboration that we called Humanizing Health and Research in the Health Sciences Theme Community, uh, which is a dormitory for health sciences majors. Uh, we gave a three-part optional workshop um, on medical uh, database information literacy. Uh, and we lured the students with pizza, which I think is extremely important, particularly when you're doing optional workshops. It's great to have the food. Uh, so my, uh, my colleagues Yamila and Scott and I met in uh, professional circles, and we decided to pool our expertise in this pilot project. Uh, Yamila is a health sciences outreach librarian. A lot of her job uh, involves um, helping folks access the health resources that are available to them on the internet. Um, it's, it can be actually rather difficult to find reliable health information on the internet. And that's, that's kind of the focus of her work. Um, and Scott has a great deal of expertise in information literacy instruction. And then for me, uh, I have been researching ways to uh, pull arts education and creative and reflective writing practice into information literacy instruction. Uh, this is combining my own work as an art artist myself, as an arts educator, and then also as a librarian who's very interested in information literacy. Um, so we thought maybe what would happen if we just combined all of these specialties into a pilot program at the health sciences theme community. Um, and the idea was to teach information literacy to an audience who were health sciences, ma sciences majors. Uh, they had information needs as students, they had future information needs as health science professionals, um, but they were also gonna have to be able to fill the information needs of their, of their patients. As that's a really fairly complex set of information needs and information audiences. Uh, and so what we did was we, we, uh, we created lessons that combined health sciences information literacy instruction, um, a lot of kind of like the database over, over, overviews and things like that, um, combined with um, creative and reflective writing prompts. And those were designed to help students uh, both understand how people can need information in different ways, uh, empathize with their patients, and be really thoughtful too about the, the way that metaphor gets deployed in uh, the health sciences. So I'm gonna take you through the activities that we did with them really quickly. Uh, you should feel extremely free to pause your recording on any one of these slides and try out the writing prompts for yourself. I do have instructions to that effect on the slides, um, but just stop me at any point and, and start writing if you, if you feel like it. Um, so the, the next, I'm gonna jump quickly if, into the very first activity that we did with our health sciences majors. Uh, a small content warning, the next slide does re contain references to miscarriage. Okay. So this first activity involved really thinking about the, meta the way we use metaphor to explain, understand, and experience illness. Metaphor really shapes our experience of illness in some really interesting and key ways. We can't really function without it. We can't communicate without metaphor. 
Um, and especially, it's especially hard to communicate without metaphor when we're talking about new and unfamiliar information um, or new and unfamiliar experiences. Um, so we just dived with these students right into um, uh, an activity that really kind of worked metaphor in a bunch of different ways. And then we started off with a reading of this poem by Cynthia Marie Hoffman. It's called Miscarriage. I'll read it quickly. Your baby weighs as much as a paper clip. As an envelope, you forgot to seal the note inside. Your baby is the tip of an eraser. Your baby is the water spilling past your palm. The towel came out of the wash like new. The nightgown you had been wearing came out with all its tiny purple tulips still blooming. The room is scrubbed clean as clean can be. Tomorrow, your friend is as far along as you would be right now. Her baby is a plum. But for now, your bed is trimmed with the scent of lemons. So this is, um, this, this is an incredible poem to use with, with a medical uh, students, uh, because it, it just it just really personalizes a, a distressingly common medical occurrence um, from the patient's perspective. Um, and so, one thing that I asked students to do was we read it a couple of times. I would ask students to underline all the comparisons in the poem. We didn't bother too much with distinguishing between meta metaphor and simile. Um, the the key here is that the baby is being compared to so many things. And then there are other things that get compared as the course of the poem goes. So we thought about like, what are the common threads between the things that the baby is compared to? Um, thinking about, for example, um, the baby is, is compared to very small, very quotidian things, right? Um, and then there's that very painful comparison with the friend that, that really detonates at the end of the poem. Um, and so the way that the, these smaller comparisons uh, build and build in the beginning of the poem tends to help just kind of let that let that grief grow larger at toward the end. Um, there's a lot of other different things to say about the comparisons in these poems. The students always surprise me. They always come up with something different when we when we talk about this. Um, you may notice things that I I failed to mention here. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll just move quickly to um, taking the lessons of this poem and trying to. Um, use it to think about how we use metaphors ourselves. So what I, what I asked students to do after reading this poem was to think about the common medical metaphors that they heard. And I would have them list them up on, up on the whiteboard. Um, so for example, like he lost his battle with cancer, she's fighting cancer. What is, that, what is that comparing the patient to, right? It's comparing the patient to a warrior, to a soldier. Um, she beat cancer. Um, it, it compares the patient to uh, either an aggressor or um, perhaps a, somebody who's good at games. Um, I'm in for a tune-up, a much different kind of a metaphor, this idea of the body as a machine, right? Um, so all of these have, uh, this is not to say that these, are that these metaphors should never be used, but they should probably be used with thoughtfulness, right? Uh, if What happens if she, she who is fighting cancer, quote unquote, loses the battle with cancer? Is that her fault? Probably not. Right? And so there's only so far that those metaphors can take us. And we talked about that a lot, uh, just the ethics of, of using metaphors to, to speak about illness um, with, these, with, with these students. Um, so whenever you're feeling it, uh, press, press pause on your recording and try this out. Um, this is the prompt that I gave the students to finish off this activity. Illness is a, and think about all the things you can compare an illness to. When you're ready to continue, plus play, press play on your recording. Uh, this next activity is one that I do with a lot of different uh, students that come to the Poetry Center Library. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in helping students to think about uh, why they do what they do, why, they, why they're interested in the topics they're interested in. And I feel like poetry really gives us the tools to explore this in interesting ways, in ways that help students kind of leave this one, this little one-shot class with, with hopefully a deepened sense of purpose. Um, it seems like a large, 
<laughs> load or burden for a one shot to accomplish, but it's what, it's what we try to do. Um, so when I have uh, students come into the Poetry Center Library, this is a library of special, con uh, of a, it's a special collections library of contemporary poetry. It's got about 50,000 books. They're all, po it's all poems, so all the titles are kind of wacky. Um, and I'll have students coming in with, you know, English 102, um, or, you know, sometimes we'll have uh, science classes coming in. Um, we definitely use this with the health sciences students as well. Um, using the, using um, the language that they find in the poetry center to write creatively about research topics they're interested in. Um, so this, this activity is really very simple and extremely adaptable. Uh, you could do it almost anywhere that has a collection of books. Um, the, the, the prep work is just two, two prompts. One, jot down a research topic you're interested in. Two, jot some notes. Why do you think you're interested in this topic, All right? Um, so I give students some time to, to write about that. I generally don't ask them to share any of that thinking, that's theirs. Uh, and then I will send students out into the collection or in the case of these um, special lessons that we did in the health sciences dorms, I just showed a picture of some spines. Uh, and I had students write a poem about a research topic uh, use remix by remixing the uh, words that they found on the spines of books. Um, it's important to note that there are re there's really no wrong way to do this. Um, students can use titles as whole chunks. So if somebody wanted to uh, use another city as a phrase, uh, that would be fine. Or if somebody wanted to take the word another and mix it up with buildings and you know take take their sentence from there, that would also be fine. It does not really matter. Uh, the idea is to use the language that you find in an external setting. Uh, recombine it and uh, write a poem about the uh, the topic that you're interested in. And um, then I usually wind up this activity uh, just by asking students to do some reflection and writing and discussion amongst themselves about like what the differences are between research that we're motivated to do and research that we're not motivated to do. <laughs> uh, and then we, we have a discussion about how a lot of the collegiate experience is really helping students move away from the kinds of things that are assigned to them and move into their into their full stature as researchers uh, who are motivated by curiosity, right? So we talk about curiosity as a, so this, this is the, the, these are the, the, the tools I think that poetry has to help us get at some of these deeper questions. And then the uh, final activity that I used with the health sciences students uh, was stolen straight out of the medical humanities literature, uh, and this is this is a, a really a really fun one, really easy, and again very easy to adapt and just easy to do with students just about anywhere. Um, it it's, tends to work best when you have a, a population of students that has cell phones, but that's about the only restriction. Um, so what I usually ask students to do is uh, to pull out their cell phones and to select two photos: one photo that represents the future one photo that represents a choice that is necessary. Well, if they have those two photos, um, this is the, this is the uh, activity that I gave, that I gave the students. Uh, pull out your cell phone, two, those two, two photographs, one that represents the future, one that represents a choice that is necessary. Um, and then share your images with a partner. What, is the photo, what do these photographs mean to you? Uh, what part of your life does each photograph illustrate? Um, and then we just kind of uh, share back to the group. We can't do that here because we are virtual and asynchronous. Uh, and I was really looking forward to this part of the, of the Collapse Conference. Um, so I'm going to invite everybody to press pause uh, while you uh, give this activity for a spin. Uh, write down some notes in response to these prompts. Uh, and when you're ready, pl press play for the next slide. I should mention that this can be done just as a, as a meditative writing practice if you're by yourself. Or you could uh, pull it out and uh, pull out your cell phone and compare photos with your quarantine partner if you have one in the house. All right, um, I'm about to yield the floor to Pam, um, but I just wanted to mention too that uh, I have focused really heavily in my presentation on the creative activities that we did because that's what I brought to this partnership. Uh, what we did was we partnered, uh, we, we, we kind of split time fairly evenly between the creative writing activities and the more standard uh, database instruction. And um, what we found when we did that was that students really started to talk, really started to blend them in interesting ways. They really started to talk about like which resources they would um, point hypothetical patients toward. Uh, when we did the photographs of the future and the photographs of, of things that are necessary, uh, the, <laughs> the, a lot of students would do that for themselves. And then they'd always also start to think about the kinds of choices that are facing their patients. So like the, this kind of um, integrative work 
continues in, in people's brains. When you combine the database instruction with this kind of, you know, off the wall creative writing activities, a really interesting things happen. So I'm really uh, hopeful for this as a direction for medical humanities. And now I, I yield the floor to Pam. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as I said in my introduction, I am at Oregon Health and Science University, uh, which is was a bit of adjustment coming to that context uh, because a lot of times at a large state university, you can draw on the humanity schools um, and you and partner with them. Uh, but OHSU does have a long history of creating a space for narrative medicine. And Dr. Elizabeth Lotti uh, has been instrumental in that. And OHSU did used to be part of the University of Oregon, but that split happened in 1981. Uh, but then in 2013, with Dr. Lotti's work, the School of Medicine received a large grant from the American Medical Association uh, to really think through uh, the, the undergraduate curriculum. And part of the changes that were made from that grant uh, was creating more of a space for reflective practice. Uh, so at OHSU, I've been able to facilitate various intercessions that focus on topics like cognitive impairment, infection, uh, pain, cancer. Um, and we have uh, readings that the students do. Uh, there's also sometimes pieces of art that they look at, sometimes short videos that they watch. Uh, and then they come to class uh, ready to discuss those things and also with their own pieces of writing to share. And the students actually, for the most part, really seem to be doing the readings um, and they, they participate. Now, that has become uh, more challenging as we've just in the last couple of weeks uh, started to facilitate uh, online. Uh, so having the same level of participation as we used to in person has been an adjustment and the intercessions have become less focused on the themes and more focused on what is happening currently, uh, which I think is natural. And that's a discussion that I welcome that narrative medicine can provide a space for that. And the Northwest Narrative Medicine Collaborative also is a part of this community and, and OHSU staff and faculty and students uh, sometimes take part in that group. And that used to happen at the Lucky Lab in Southeast uh, Portland. And that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so, but we have, the collaborative has fully transitioned uh, to doing online evening webinars, um, and they've been doing two a month, and there has been new benefits to that. Uh, there have been more people that are able to attend, uh, they're more accessible, and so in some ways people feel more able to engage within that online space. Uh, so it's been welcome uh, to see those advantages. And this one of, in the infection intercession, we had poetry from our historical collections and archives uh, that was about syphilis, uh, which because OHSU had a whole uh, plastic surgeon, Dr. Adalbert Bettman, who was made his career on doing plastic surgery after people had suffered the effects of that. And he chose to write a whole collection of poetry, uh, kind of inspired uh, by his practice. And one of the poems uh, that he wrote, and again, this was in 1931. Uh, so you think about the Great Depression still fully underway at that point. Uh, but he wrote a poem called Mrs. Bertie Millard. My life was very happy and I married James. As a June bride in September, I noticed a rash on my body. But as it did not itch, James said it was nothing. But I lost the baby at four months and the second one at three months. Then I consulted Dr. Brown, who said I had syphilis. Too late I found out what that was and that I could have been cured had I received treatment earlier. So not exactly a feel-good, uplifting poem there, uh, but it does uh, speak uh, to frustrations with healthcare um, and the, the timing of when treatment is received and when do you consult a doctor and who, 
who is sometimes in a healthcare situation, you want to blame someone. Whether that's the best response or not, sometimes that happens. Usually it's not the best response. Uh, but the students, when we would talk about this poem, they would go right uh, to James, which takes us to our next poem. Which is from James's perspective. I knew in April what was the matter with me, but it, had I been taught that what one did not know would not hurt them, so I did not tell Bertie. I found out my mistake to my sorrow. Had I been cured before I married, four lives would have been saved. So when I'm discussing this poem with the students, the students go right to that four lives part. Um, and they think about the family that these people were trying to create and the choices that James has been made. And then they feel angry at James. Uh, and, and then sometimes we also discuss the ethics of a plastic surgeon writing poems from the perspectives of patients um, and what that is even saying. And who, how do you lay claim to different stories uh, within the healthcare setting? And do you, patients should always get the chance to tell their own story, uh, but that sometimes gets shaped or isn't allowed to happen due to different circumstances that are occurring. Um, and then there's also things that have to be in place for patients to be able to come forward and share their stories in the first place, to be able to seek treatment. Um, so these are, these are poems that present opportunities for discussion and for relating to the larger healthcare setting. So this is again an opportunity uh, where I was really looking forward to talking these things through in person. Uh, but you can again pause if you wish after looking through these questions then choose when you wish to restart. Uh, but to, to just think about a few questions that you would ask these patients um, because there's, we only get part of their story. And to again come back to what I talked about, about the power differential in having a doctor write about his patients. So just go ahead and move forward whenever you feel you paused enough. Thank you, Pam. And then this was going to be uh, the, the kind of key of our time together, uh, really thinking as a, as a community, uh, a very, uh, an ephemeral community at a conference about uh, how, how we could use the lessons from, from this, uh, this kind of practice uh, in our own work, in our own practice as as librarians, as librarians who teach information literacy, as librarians who think very hard about power differentials uh, in, in uh, information flows. Um, and so I would, I'm just going to invite y'all to uh, take really a longer time here. Um, press pause, take around 15 to 20 minutes or whatever seems like the right amount of time to you to write down some responses to these questions. Um, and then when you're ready, please do pl press play to continue. Um, So you can reach us with your uh, questions and hopefully our answers at these email addresses. Uh, I'm Sarah. I am at ssk at email.arizona.edu. And I am Pam Pierce. And I am at piercepa at ohsu.edu. Fantastic. Um, at the time of this recording, we're not quite sure what our synchronous options might be uh, for, a, for, a, for a real time community discussion. We'll hope that that's possible and we will post uh, instructions for any, any kind of uh, feedback session or Q, live Q&A uh, when we post the recording, if we get those inst instructions from the organizers. I'm going to close by just uh, pointing you to our rec references list. This is also a pretty good uh, place to start if you're interested in learning more about the very, the kind of very specific uh, field of medical, medical humanities and the, and the creative writing and reflective practice that goes on with health sciences professions and in their training. Um, there's been a lot of really exciting research done on this. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're hoping to contribute a few uh, exercises and uh, really foster conversation between practitioners who are interested in bringing the arts, meditation, reflection, uh, and really self-awareness training and empathy training uh, to a much mm -hmm. uh, greater prominence within uh, the training of medical, medical professionals. So we will end it here. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. We will hope to hear from you all.